Thank you very much for the um, organisers of this course for the um, invitation to talk today. Um, I'm going to talk first of all about the uh, 100,000 Genomes Project and its legacy and then move on to talk a bit about um, genomic medicine um, in the NHS and its relevance for um, dermatology in spe um, specifically. So um, I'm a clinical geneticist, I work at Genomics England and I also have a clinical advisor role for um, NHS um, England. So um, I'm going to start off by talking a bit about the 100,000 Genomes Project and um, its outcomes and with a specific focus on dermatology, about some of the ongoing research we've got on this um, cohort and the translation of that research into clinical care, um, and then um, finally look at the, um, the test technology of whole genome sequencing and how that is progressing towards uh, one-step diagnostics. So um, the 100,000 Genomes Project was um, a... Um, a very large translational research project with its roots very firmly in the NHS. So NHS teams um, in the genomic medicine centres were responsible for taking um, consent from patients to, and supplying clinical data. The data and the sequence data then all um, got uh, sent over to Genomics England where it all now sits within our informatics architecture and is accessed by the NHS to return results to patients and also by researchers. The final patients were recruited to the project in September 2018. Um, and the final results are now being returned to clinicians and patients. And there was a bit of a gap between uh, patients being recruited and the results of that, those tests going back into the NHS. And that was really because the um, process of setting up all of the processes and systems and architecture that was required to do that was um, quite complex. So there are um, now um, over 70,000 rare disease patients and their relatives who've taken part in the project and whose genomes are um, available in this cohort. There was also a cancer arm of the project, but I'm not going to cover that uh, today, but happy to take any questions relevant to that um, later on. So dermatology um, played its part in the 100,000 Genomes Project, and you can see here that there were a number of different dermatological conditions which were um, uh, recruited to the project with varying numbers of patients with some quite large um, cohorts and also some smaller ones. And I think also it's fair to say some cohorts which are very clearly um, monogenic conditions almost entirely, and others which are really more um, research-oriented orientated conditions where the patient's data is unlikely to have yielded a, a diagnosis in the first round, but where those, um, that, those um, genomes are available for research um, into the condition in future. So the, there was no um, age limits to recruitment. Pro people could be recruited at any, any stage in life. Um, you can see at the top left there, the overall profile of um, age at recruitment to the project. And you can see unsurprisingly for a rare disease project, there was very much a bias towards pediatric uh, recruitment, but with also with a significant number of people um, recruited later in life. Um, some of those with later onset disorders. Um, and um, so, um, and many of them obviously without their relatives um, being recruited with them um, because of those being later onset disorders. And you can see in the dermatological disorders, which I've highlighted there in pink, that, um, that the, the, the bias towards the paediatric end of the age group was really even stronger um, in dermatology than in some of the other disorder areas. In terms of the results that we're feeding back to patients, uh, we are um, returning, as I've already said, results about a patient's main condition, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a minute. There is also the option um, for patients to opt in for additional health related information about serious and actionable conditions. And I'll talk briefly about that um, as well. The third type of result are those related to reproductive risks or carrier status. This type of result is really terribly complex and um, we're really only just getting started and thinking about how we do this um, well for patients um, at the moment. So I won't go any further into that um, at the moment. So as you'll have been learning um, during the course of this week, the um, trick of medical genomics is really the needle in a haystack problem. So um, our uh, genome has um, 3 billion DNA base pairs and 5 million places where our genomes vary from the reference sequence. Um, we all have around half a million novel variants, which have never been seen before, about 20,000 variants which affect our protein coating genes and 100 very rare variants which affect our protein coding genes. So what we're aiming to do in terms of the um, automated bioinformatics pipeline is to filter these down to a number which can be outputted by the pipeline, which can then be reviewed manually by clinical scientists. And you, in order to make that practicable, you really need to get down to about five or 10 variants per person. But while doing that, what you don't want to do is filter out the diagnosis wherever you can avoid it. So obviously you want to preserve sensitivity while doing that. So this is a, this is a pretty major uh, challenge. 
And this is how this has been tackled for at least for the small um, variants and small um, insertions and deletions um, in, the, um, in the genome. So the uh, variant prioritization pipeline, it uses a fairly standard set of filters. So it asks whether the variant is rare in the population um, as we're dealing with rare disorders, whether it alters the protein in at least one transcript, and whether the variant is present in the um, family members where we would expect it to be present and absent in those where we would expect it to be absent, so um, the segregation pattern. It then goes on to ask whether the variant is in a green gene, in a pan gene panel that was applied to the participant. So the gene panels were created for um, each disorder in the project, and um, this was the, um, the stage in the process which was used to um, align the phenotype of the patient with the uh, prioritised variants. The, um, the, it, the mode of inheritance for each of those genes is also specified in panel app. Um, so whether, the, whether you're expecting it to be a recessive condition or a dominant condition, for example. And finally, looking at the um, consequence of the variant for the protein, does it um, result in a loss of function or a more moderate impact on the protein? And is it de novo in the um, affected person and absent in their parents if we have that family structure available to us? So when all of those questions are processed, we end up with some tiering outputs. So tier one and tier two are those where we would expect the majority of diagnoses to land. But we know that there are a number of reasons why variants can end up in tier three. These variant lists are then reviewed by um, NHS laboratories, and those are used to generate um, diagnostic results for the patient. So this is the output of that uh, pipeline for um, over 35,000 families with rare and inherited disorders in the program. And overall, about one in five patients in the main program so far has received a diagnosis. This rate is going up um, over time. But at the current point, it's around 20%. And these patients, have a lot of them have had a lot of genetic testing already in the NHS. So this is a 20% yield on top of all available um, NHS um, testing. And some of them were from um, disorder categories, which were really more research orientated, as I, as I mentioned before. And at the top of the bars there, you can see that the number of, of families that this is based on. So um, I've just shown there that skin um, is, um, has a very uh, respectable um, diagnostic yield. It's um, up there um, on the left. And you can see there some of the uh, constituents of the skin um, uh, group with the larger disorder categories, where the, um, which is the breakdown of some of those results in specific skin disorders. So there were a large number of, of diagnoses made in dermatology patients. Um, and I think um, you've heard about some of those in the course um, of the last couple of days. The additional findings are um, relate to other information in the genome, which can be helpful for healthcare. These were optional. Patients could decide whether they wanted them or not. The majority of findings that we're looking for, because they have to be um, the conditions that we understand well, where we understand the genetics well, and where there is something we can do about them. The majority of these are cancer predisposition genes. There is also there, and there are also the familial, familial hypercholesterolemia genes. These are due to start being returned in 2021, and we anticipate that approximately 2% of participants will receive a positive result. And what we don't yet know is what is the clinical impact of those results and what will be the result for their um, healthcare. Um, and that is something that will be uh, monitored very closely as part of the ongoing research from this, um, from this effort. So um, the, the genomes that were, um, that were um, sequenced as part of the project are now all available in the research environment. And you can see here the number of um, participants and genomes that are now available in that environment. And as well as the primary uh, clinical data that was submitted for those patients, we also have the secondary data um, from NHS Digital. So these include things like hospital episode statistics um, and um, patient reported, well, we're working on patient reported um, outcome measures. Um, and we have some COVID diagnosis data in there, for example. So there's quite a lot of information in there. And that means that if you have an interest in researching patients who have disorders that weren't specifically recruited to the project, you can often nevertheless develop a cohort of patients who have been affected with disorders by using particularly the, the hospital episode um, statistics data. The outcomes of the interpretation are also there um, in the uh, research environment. And all of this is without any of the names or NHS numbers and dates of birth and so on for those patients. So they've been de-identified. The research consortium is known as GSIP or the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnership. And this is divided up into uh, disease areas. So there is a, a skin domain within the um, GSIP. And it has a number of subdomains, which you can see listed there. And you can see that in terms of the leads of those domains, many of the people you've been hearing from over the last few days are um, subdomain leads and are themselves um, working on, on 100K um, data.
one of the things that we're um, very interested in um, now is how we um, is how we take that data and um, make it really really useful for um, for patients um, in terms of the research outputs. So what you can see at the middle there is what we call the infinity loop, which is on the left hand side. You have um, the healthcare um, world um, in which um, genomics is being used for diagnostic purposes, and on the right hand side you can see uh, there's the research world which is making diagnostic discoveries, making discoveries in the world of genomics. And they really have to keep meeting and feeding each other in the center of that uh, infinity loop. And so we're, we're interested in how we streamline that uh, interaction. So we have a number of, number of different contexts in which those, um, those elements interact. So we have um, situations where um, researchers come across diagnoses for patients, and we call that diagnostic um, discovery. And those, are, those can be passed back to the NHS. We have situations where, um, where researchers would like to get some extra information or would like to collaborate with a, a, a clinician, for example, to describe a new phenotype or extend the, um, extend the phenotype of a known gene. And also situations where um, clinicians might want to um, send messages or get help for, um, from either specific researchers or the research world uh, in general. And, those, and so we have requests for expert review um, that go back to researchers. And we're really in the process of trying to formalise and streamline all of those interactions at the moment to make them as productive as possible, both for patients and clinicians and also for researchers. So we, there are a number of reasons why during the diagnostic analysis, um, they, um, a, a, the, a, a diagnosis might not have been detected. So they might be um, structural variants or copy number variants analyzed before the pipeline was looking for those um, types of, of variant. They might be novel genes um, and the patient might have had their analysis done before there was diagnostic grade evidence for that gene. There might not have been a relevant panel available for that particular phenotype. We had some very, very rare um, phenotypes, which really can only be solved by individual um, analysis. Um, they might be um, non-coding variants, which weren't prioritized by the pipeline. Or they might be variants where the segregation pattern, um, as originally thought to, um, thought to occur, doesn't fit with the, the pattern of the identified variant in the family. Although in some cases, when you look back with hindsight, you can see that that is actually um, a, a plausible explanation. So we've got the first um, 150 or so researcher identified diagnoses back in the NHS um, being processed by uh, NHS labs at the moment. So there are there, there are some challenges of, um, of passing this information backwards and forwards between um, particularly returning the research diagnoses into the um, NHS. So we know that uh, clinicians and researchers are working in quite different contexts. So um, researchers have to work uh, behind a firewall, so in a de-identified context, and we need a process for um, conveying information about individual variants back from that research world into the healthcare world. That clearly needs to be accurate, it needs to be the right patient, it needs to be the right variant, um, and ideally it needs to be semi-automated to allow that to scale, and that's something we're working on at the moment. Um, in the other direction, the um, clinician may not be able to act on the variant without um, uh, more data from the researcher, so being able to facilitate a two-way dialogue um, often really helps here. But clinician, clinicians and clinical scientists do work in a, in a, in a specific um, diagnostic context in which diagnostic labs are focused very much on their prospective workload, um, and they um, then revisiting uh, previous results does require um, additional resource, which um, may be problematic. And also diagnostic labs re require control of their workload and their workflow. And in contrast to that, uh, research findings are obviously unpredictable in both timing and in volume. And so um, matching those, um, those, um, those situations is, is complex. And in addition, some uh, nominated variants that researchers have identified may not be relevant. And we've had a few which have been um, nominated, which are actually incidental findings, which are not appropriate to return under the terms of consent. And so we need mechanisms to ensure that um, that, that doesn't happen. So it is, um, it is complex um, um, operating at this interface, but we do believe it's um, very worthwhile. And this is an example um, of, of why. So this is a little boy who um, was presented to West London Genomic Medicine Centre. He presented with anemia and developmental delay and short stature. And his sequencing in the 100,000 Genomes Project found a de novo mutation in THRA, which causes a treatable form of thyroid um, hormone resistance, which presents with normal um, thyroid hormone levels. So TFTs are normal. Um, he was, he's now on research monitored treatment in Cambridge um, with his ty thyroxine titrated to his metabolic rate, not to his TFTs, and his parents report a really substantial um, improvement in his um, growth and his um, general health. 
So based on that experience, we um, the, at Genomics England then worked with Chris, Chat Chris Chatterjee's team in Cambridge to um, identify other families in the project who have the same diagnosis. And there are now a further seven families from all over the country with the same condition who have also been referred for um, treatment in Cambridge. So this is an example of where the, um, research, the interface between research and clinical care has really, um, has really worked for, for those families. And if you want to hear more about um, that, this little boy and his experience of the, the project, um, there is a video about him um, on the Genomics England website. So this, this situation is really what motivates us all on both sides, both the researchers and the clinicians, to um, push forward and make sure that we are able to share information across that boundary without sharing data inappropriately. So finally, um, I just wanted to talk about um, some of the um, pipeline enhancements that are going on at the moment and about how we're translating those um, uh, for uh, clinical care. So this is a, um, a picture of a um, short tandem repeat. These are the triplet repeats, which cause um, conditions such as Huntington's disease and Fragile X syndrome. And there is a special pipeline component designed to detect these, which is called Expansion Hunter. And um, it was, if you would, had asked us you know, five or six years ago whether we were likely to be calling short tandem repeats from genome sequence data, we would all have said, you know, we, that, that seemed very, um, very unlikely. But here we are, we now have a pipeline that can um, identify these uh, repeats from the whole genome sequence data. And we've been validating this data against um, known positive and negative um, 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 STRs uh, diagnosed using standard of care. And we get very good discrimination between the normal alleles in blue on the left and the expanded alleles in red on the right. We do find that the precise sizing in the larger ranges um, requires an uh, orthogonal test using a different using the standard NHS test, but the discrimination between normal and expanded um, is, is, um, is pretty accurate. And we've, um, with a, as a result of that pipeline, we've made a number of um, uh, uh, diagnoses of Huntington's disease and Fragile X and various other, other conditions which are caused by short tandem repeats, which we wouldn't necessarily have expected to be either looking for or finding um, in the project. And those results have been returned to the NHS. Um, copy number variants, which I'm sure you've heard about over the last um, few days, are um, where you've got a larger chunk of DNA either missing or extra. And um, what you can see here in, the, in this particular um, genome is a deletion of around 5,000 DNA base pairs. And you can see where the, uh, the coverage drops off there and the red line shows where that, um, that deletion um, sits. And this, this deletion is smaller than you would normally expect to detect um, using um, most um, te technologies in, the, um, in current diagnostic use. So this is the kind of size range where there are probably quite a lot of diagnoses that at present are hard to get to um, using standard of care tests. This is another example of a bigger um, meg um, megabase um, heterozygous deletion. And um, you can see on the top row here, the um, genome sequence um, clearly shows the size of this deletion. And on the bottom um, row here, the previous standard of care diagnostic test had identified that there was a deletion, but, the, um, the, but it looked like a much smaller deletion. So the extent of that deletion wasn't clear from the previous test that had been done um, in the NHS. And so we're getting better um, resolution of which, which genes are likely to be affected by these, um, by these sorts of large copy number variants from the genome data. But we do recognise that um, the ability to detect each variant type and make pretty pictures and demonstrate that we can see them in the data really is um, only the first step um, here in terms of um, using these for diagnostic testing. So um, what I'm just showing here is the stages in moving through, through from being able to demonstrate that we can detect them through to testing them against positive control samples um, against, and, and testing them against standard of care tests and then determining their sensitivity, their specificity and their limitations, and then finally getting to the point where they are automated and also very importantly accredited um, for use in the diagnostic world. So for small variants now, we've been through all of those processes and, um, and for, for genome sequencing and they're, they're all in place. For the short tandem repeats and the larger copy number variants, we are very nearly there. We're still, we're still just doing the final stages of reviewing the validation data um, and, um, and finalizing the automation and accreditation. For the smaller copy number variants um, and structural variants, this is really very much a work in progress. We know we can detect a lot of them, but the sensitivity and specificity isn't clear. We don't know how many of them we're able to detect and how many we miss, hampered of course by the fact that actually um, there is very limited detection using current diagnostic um, test technologies. So that is very much still a work in progress. 
So in terms of where we're, um, where we're heading with this, we are working on new pipeline um, elements for the, uh, as, as discussed. And we're also very keen to make sure that uh, genomic medicine within the NHS um, forms a learning system so that every genomic test is an opportunity for, to increase our knowledge and increase our, um, increase our standardization across the NHS um, um, at, and the um, UK um, health community. So we have three systems at Genomics England, which are particularly um, designed to do this. We have Panel App, which you may have come across, which is a, a knowledge base of gene uh, disease relationships and the evidence behind those. We have the Clinical Variant Arc, which is a knowledge base of um, how um, clinical, clinically relevant um, relationships between variants and phenotypes um, are captured through the diagnostic reporting process. And we have um, OpenCGA, which is a population scale um, database of variants um, and phenotypes. So um, these components are very much integrated into the um, diagnostic pipeline and um, are being used to um, harvest the learning from that and then feed that back into NHS care. So um, in conclusion, um, we've got around 7,000 patients and families who've received a diagnosis from the rare disease part of the 100,000 Genomes Project so far. But as you've seen with the diagnostic discovery work that we're doing, that is increasing um, all the time. There um, is genomic and clinical data available to researchers from hundreds of patients with skin disorders um, through the GSIP consortium. And if you'd be interested in joining that, there's more information on the, um, on the Genomics England website. And the legacy of the project diagnostically is really the development of the systems and processes and expertise to adopt WGS for um, whole genome sequencing for diagnostic testing. And I will talk more about that um, in my next session and then looking forward to taking some questions after that. Thank you very much.